I am Dr. KT Waxman. I'm the prof uh, professor and director of the DMP program. And I'm here with the Dr. Annette Carley, who's a uh, clinical professor and associate director of the DMP program. Her and I work very closely together in the post-master's pathway for the DNP. Um, Dr. Carly was actually um, the developer and implementer of this program from the very beginning. And I joined a few years later. And so we are a team and we work together um, in the seven quarter program uh, to, to prepare people for their DNP. So welcome to everyone tonight. I'm gonna kick us off with the first slide here. Um, the first thing we want to talk about is uh, the difference between the DMP and PhD. Many of you are looking to get a doctorate degree, and we want to ensure that this is the right degree for you. Uh, the PhD is, is different than the DNP. Uh, for with the DMP, and I am a DMP uh, graduate, and so is Dr. Carley. I was one of the first graduates in the state of California, and Dr. Carley got her DMP back east but early on uh, with the evolution of the DMP. So we're sort of um, old dinosaurs in the DMP world, uh, having been DMP since uh, the beginning. Um, the DMP is really a, a degree uh, that takes the evidence-based practice and translate that ev translates that evidence into practice. So this is a practice doctorate whereas the PhD is a research doctorate. So if any of you on the line are looking at doing research or becoming a res researcher, then we will refer you to our colleagues in the PhD program. The DMP generates internal evidence through quality improvement, outcomes management, and evidence-based practice projects, and mentors others in evidence-based practice in the creation of systems to sustain it. So ultimately, the combination of the work of the DMP and PhD are geared towards improving patient, population, or policy outcomes. So those PhDs do research, look at external evidence, including translational research to inform practice and policy, and they are extension of science of nursing, and they generate evidence-based theories. So we often, as DMP graduates, take the work that the PhD has produced and translate it and implement it into practice. Next slide. So as I said, it's a practice-focused academic degree. It's not a role, it's a degree. We can talk more if you have questions about what roles the DMP graduate might assume upon graduation but it is a degree. It prepares experts. You will become an expert in the topic of your, your choice, your passion, and you will learn a lot about that topic and become an expert to create, implement, and evaluate your final project, which we'll talk about. So be an expert in evidence-based practice, quality improvement, and leadership. There's a leadership thread throughout our entire curriculum. So we prepare post-masters folks as leaders in nursing practice, whether they manage people or patients. It just depends on where you work along the continuum. We blend clinical leadership, economic and organizational skills in direct and indirect practice to positively impact outcomes. So those of you who are nurse practitioners would have direct skills with patients and we have those who are not nurse practitioners who are utilizing indirect practice to positively impact patient outcomes or population outcomes. Whatever outcome we're trying to achieve, it could be either indirect or direct, hands-on or, or hands-off. We prepare students for leadership opportunities in a variety of settings along the continuum. And the DNP is endorsed by professional organizations as the entry level for the CRNA, the CNS, and the NP. Now the CRNA has already uh, endorsed and adopted the DMP as the entry to practice for a CRNA. And the CNS is looking at solidifying that in 2030. And the nurse practitioners are looking at 2025. 
So we are a little behind, but also ahead of the curve to prepare folks in um, in their DNP for these professional organizations. Now, the nurse leaders out there that are not nurse practitioners or APRNs um, are, I would say, endorsed by organizations like the American Organization for Nursing Leadership, the Association of California Nurse Leaders, and organizations like that, even though those are not considered advanced practice. Next slide. So AACN, which is the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, which is um, different than the Critical Care Association, they have um, specific competencies and essentials that we have built our program around. And you can read them here, they're person-centered care, interprofessional quality improvement, and they've added um, two at the very bottom, professionalism and personal professional leadership development. So we, as I said earlier, we have a leadership thread. We really work um, with our students to prepare them to uh, have a professional appearance, showing up as a leader, executive presence, and continuing to grow as a professional and continuing to um, work on leadership development so that they could um, present an idea, a thought, a solution at any time with anyone um, if, if they need to. So that's what we really focus on. Next slide. So our roadmap, if you will, is this is a post-master's program. You need a master's degree. It does not have to be in nursing. You have to have a BSN and a master's degree to qualify to apply for this uh, program. We have a cohort model in which we begin in September or fall of every year and those students who begin together continue throughout their entire seven quarters as a cohort. So we're admitted, you admit and start in the September. We have seven continuous quarters, which includes summer. We're a year round program. And we also require practicum hours. And I think Dr. Carlo, you're gonna talk a little bit more about practicum later on. Okay, so I'll, I'll just say that everyone needs to complete a thousand practicum hours, but we do allow you to transfer some in and Dr. Carly will address that. And then this culminates at the end of your uh, journey with an evidence-based quality improvement project. This is something that you have identified as an issue, as a dilemma, as a problem, as something you want to solve, make better based on the evidence. And you will create a develop a project, you'll implement it, and then you will evaluate it um, by the end of the seventh quarter. Next slide. So this, we call it the EBQIP, which is the Evidence-Based Quality Improvement Project. And this is something that you should start thinking about before you come into the program. What are you really passionate about? Is it falls? Is it sepsis? Is it patient satisfaction, staff engagement? What is it that you want to improve? So we focus on the scholarly translation of that research. You're going to research that topic. You're going to look at the evidence around this topic. You're going to focus on practice improvement or quality improvement. How are you going to implement something to make a difference in the setting in which you either work or where you would like to do your project? It's 90% of our students do their projects where they work. Um, and if they can't, or there is no buy-in, um, we assist on finding um, a site for them to do their project. It needs to be scaled to accomplish in four academic quarters. We have a lot of students who have grandiose ideas, you know, well, let me solve world hunger. Let me do this huge implementation. And we as faculty, as advisors, as chairs, we help you focus on what is doable in four quarters. Um, you need to have practice site support. So wherever you work, start thinking about, you know, talking to your supervisor, your a CNS, a, a physician liaison, liaison who perhaps would support you in your project. Because we need to have signed document that you actually have support at your site to do your project. And then demonstrate implementation at the system or population level. 
and evaluation of outcomes. So this is, this is not a small test of change. This is a little bigger than that. It's hopefully on a unit in a clinic, perhaps in a hospital setting, large scale change um, to the best of your ability. And then hopefully have that, have a plan after you graduate for this to continue under your leadership or delegate it to someone else. This link here and these slides are available for you is a link to uh, samples of our doctoral uh, program scholarly project. So you can actually take a look at what some of those um, look like. And that link is available. So here are some examples of some of our current and past DNP projects. Um, and you can see there's, there's a wide range, whether you're an APRN or a nurse leader, whether you work in a clinic or a hospital setting along the continuum. Uh, we've had students who have done behavior change through self-empowerment after group diabetes education. So they've evaluated it. They might have done a pre-survey to see how uh, people feel and done an implementation and then done a post-survey to see if they felt self-empowerment. Assessing HIV patient satisfaction and medication adherence through telemedicine. Telemedicine is big. You've identified a need. You want to implement a telemedicine program. Were the patients satisfied with this implementation? Structured medication reconciliation of older adults in the emergency department, very focused in the ED, but medication reconciliation. Implement measurement-based care in a VA tobacco recovery clinic. So think about what your passion is, where you work, what are the hot topics that you would like to intervene on to help improve the quality. Improving handoff communication in an inpatient psychiatric setting. Trauma-informed care training in a homeless shelter organization. And then nurse leaders perceived knowledge and confidence managing disasters in the acute care setting. So you can look at clinical, non-clinical, where there's a dilemma, a problem, an issue that you think that you can solve based on the evidence that you've researched. So that's the project sort of in a nutshell, that link can take you to some of our sample projects. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Carley to talk a little bit about our faculty and the program components. Dr. Carley. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Waxman. So hi, everyone. So we've been growing. We've been open since 2018, but we're growing steadily in size and we've grown our faculty as well. Um, our faculty collectively bring a lot of experience and a lot of role expertise. Uh, some of the experience that they bring interprofessional education and practice, healthcare finance and management, executive leadership, online education, which is a lot of this program, health policy, global health, and evidence-based practice, to name a few of the major areas. On this slide are the two of us from tonight. So on the right-hand side is Dr. Waxman, our director, and I'm in the middle of the slide, Annette Carley, and I am the associate director, and we are both DNP prepared faculty. In addition to expertise globally, our uh, faculty represent a variety of roles, such as some of the APRN roles, clinical nurse specialist and nurse practitioner, as well as nurse educator, nurse executive, informaticist, and researcher. And on this slide is a mix of faculty, DMP, as well as PhD holders. On the left hand is Dr. Julin Shen. In the middle is Dr. Elena Capella, both have PhDs. And on the right-hand side is Dr. Marianne Hulgren. And collectively, we cover a lot of practice foci across the lifespan, across levels of acuity, including areas such as women's health, pediatric health and neonatal health, school-based health, nursing education. And on this slide, uh, from the left to the right is Dr. Terry Lindgren, Next is Dr. Lisa Lummel. And on the right is Dr. Julie Maxworthy. In addition to the roles that I have or populations that I have on this slide, 
We also have practice foci such as global health, public health, informatics, and simulation. <clears throat> and on this slide are the remaining three of our faculty that teach for us in the program. On the left is Dr. Nicholas Webb. In the middle is Dr. Francine Serafin Dixon. And on the right-hand side is Dar Dr. Marjorie Barter. So collectively, we really represent a lot of what you will need to have as people guiding you through a rigorous, impactful program. So there's two applicant pathways for the post-master's program. What's shown in teal on the left was what our original concept was, and we still have this open. And this is a pathway for those who have advanced practice registered nurse preparation already, APRNs, with a master's in nursing. On the right is the additional applicant pathway that we've done for the past couple of years. And this is for RNs who have a master's, but it's not in one of the four recognized APRN roles. Those are CNS, NP, CRNA, and nurse midwife. But an RN with a master's preparation in, a, in something like informatics, nursing education is an advanced role. It is not just what's considered APRN, but we have a pathway for that type of preparation in a student as well. And you're merged together as one cohort. So let me talk a little bit about practicum hours, which uh, Dr. Waxman alluded to. So AACN, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing that developed the concept of the DMP as a degree requires that at the post baccalaureate level, you need to have evidence of completion of 1000 practicum hours. So these are nursing focused practice hours. This can be field work, this can be clinical one-on-one -on -one mentoring hours that you did in your master's NP program. It can be any number of things, but um, some of the hours will be coming into the program usually, and then we will also shepherd you through completing a total of 1,000 to be eligible for degree conferral. UCSF, because we are, um, uh, we have to abide by what AACN and our accrediting body, CCNE, expects um, in terms of hours that we can recognize coming into the program and what we need to directly have students um, complete with us. UCSF is able to allow up to 500 incoming hours to be transferred into the program. So these are at master's or post-master's level, which some of you may also have. The remaining 500 to get up to that 1,000 total are evenly distributed over the remaining uh, over the program, over the seven quarters of the program. So one to two to five units on average for any given quarter. APRN, so one of those four roles that I had mentioned, usually their programs have um, required them to um, complete at least 500 hours already. So usually that's pretty much slam dunk to transfer those hours in but it does vary with what the type of master's is you are. And we scrutinize your materials that you submit in your application to see what we can recognize as being considered um, nursing practice hours so that we can then see how much you need to complete remaining in the program. So hours from master's or prior post-master's work are both eligible as long as they're nursing related. A non-nursing master's though, if there isn't evidence of doing field work or anything that we can recognize like practice in nursing, you may need to complete the full 1000 hours in the program, but we will work with you to make that happen. There'll be a little bit heavier quarters perhaps than some of the your fellow participants, but it can be done. Um, there are two certifications, national certifications that we can recognize that non-nursing master's prepared RNs coming in may have. One is NEABC, the other is CENP. And we are able to recognize these because these are nurse executive certifications for 500 hours, just like we uh, could with um, the APRNs. But we can talk a little bit more about that later um, if needed. The general admission requirements, 
um, is evidence on a trans transcript. So we will scrutinize that for evidence that you've not only completed your master's, but where those practice hours lie that we can recognize. If you've done post-master's work and some of the hours are in there up to the 500 we can bring in, we would ask for that as well. You need to have RN licensure um, in the US. It does not have to be in California, but it needs to be in the state where you plan to do your uh, later scholarly project work. Most of our students, 95% are California based. We um, have a requirement that's similar to what the graduate division requires, a goal statement, as well as a personal statement. These give us a sense of really what your later goals are with completing the degree, but also a sense of why here, why now, why UCSF. We really want to feel that this is the right fit for you um, as a program. And especially if, there, if this reveals that your interest is in conducting research, and we see that multiple times, we may counsel you about whether this is the right type of a degree and have you speak with doctoral level uh, faculty in the PhD program. But this does give us a lot of information. You need three letters of reference. These should be from referees that can speak to your leadership activity or potential. Um, if you are more than a year out of school, um, it's best if these are employers. Um, but folks that really can speak to qualities of leadership in you that really make you a compelling applicant. A resume or a CV, whichever you have produced so that we can look at work history, volunteer history, activities, that type of thing. And then statistics. We do require statistics. It just needs to be college level and within three years of start of the program. So this is something to anticipate, but there are a lot of ways to achieve college level statistics as a requirement. There are a lot of online possibilities and we can give you some guidance with those that we have experience with so it can be done. But that's something to start thinking about now. And I guess that is all I had to say. So let me get rid of this, turn this into a big screen and answer direct questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Carley. I saw a lot of questions in the chat um, that we can address. Mimi, do you wanna review those questions so that we can answer those? Of course. All right, so we have a first question from Alexandra. Uh, they're asking, I completed my MSN at UCSF through the MEPIN program and so do not have a BSN, but I still qualify for admission to the DMP program. With your master's in nursing, yes. Yes, oh. and I think I did misspeak, miss, I misspoke earlier and said BSN. If you have the MSN um, and a bachelor's in something else, you do qualify. Alexander, what program were you in at the master's level? I did the AG PCNP, the Perfect. adult Gero. Mm -hmm. You've certainly got 500 eligible hours from completing <laughs> that program. Um, great. Nice to have you back. We'd love it when past grads are interested in pursuing the doctorate with us. Thank you, Dr. Carly. Another question we have in the chat is asking, also, I just want to put it out there. If you have a question and you would like to say it out loud and not put it in the chat, you are more than welcome to raise your hand. Um, we'll also be taking questions that way as well. Uh, we have a question from Ayo. Are there any faculty with practice for SI in occupational and environmental health? Now that's a really good question. Um, we often come up with... Um requests for certain areas that the faculty aren't experts in, but we have a committee for every single student, which includes a chair, a second reader, and a, a site liaison. And so we would try very hard to identify someone within the School of Nursing faculty that would be an expert on that topic to be as part of your committee. So the chair doesn't always have to be the expert in your topic. They're chairing your, your project. And the second reader could be the content expert or the site liaison could be the content expert as well. So this committee uh, four, which includes you as a student and the leader of the committee. Dr. Carla, do you wanna add anything to that? 
No, I think that that's perfect. That's that's where that fit occurs. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have specifically tied to our program someone in that expertise area, but a perfect fit because it's about 50% of the time intensively that you would be in the curriculum working on your project. And that's really a way to map to that level of expertise. And we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Waxman and Dr. Carly. We have another question. How long does the goal and personal statement need to be? As a follow-up with that, would an introduction to statistics class from a community college qualify for the requirement? Ah, uh, yes. All right, let me take that one. Okay. So statistics, absolutely. Basic introductory statistics. Um, so because it, it's not to, we're not going to turn you into a statistician. We don't expect you to use elaborate measures with your work. It's really so that you have basic fluency with what you're reading, what you're expected to, you know, look at, discuss in classes, and then some basic statistical measures that you might use in your project. Um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, a four unit course um, that is more than elementary. It can be just a basic level course. So community colleges is a great idea. Um, and I talked so much that I forgot what the first question was. The first question was about uh, how long does the goal and personal statement need to be? Uh, several paragraphs is fine. It's really we want we want to get a sense. We, we don't really use it to see what your level of writing is. We're not quite that sophisticated yet with doing that, but we really want to get a sense of the personal you with those and whether this is a good match of a program so that we're, we're sure that it's the right fit for you, um, that we would benefit you with your later goals. Thank you, Dr. Carly. We have someone here asking a question. Yvonne, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Yvonne. Um, thanks for doing this, I appreciate it. Um, I am currently in a direct entry master's program and it doesn't end with um, an advanced practice. So I'd end with my regular RN. And so I was wondering how I guess it would work if I were to pursue the DNP and I wanted to specialize afterwards. You want me to sure. take a step? Yeah. So Yvonne, so if you don't, if you're not an APRN, um, we still look at your transcripts and we can transfer master's hours. So you may have a couple hundred hours that you can transfer in um, and not the up to probably won't be the 500. Um, and, and the second part was, I missed that. The second part, remind me. Um, after completing the DNP, like, is it still okay. possible to still yeah. specialize for an advanced practice? Or... Yeah. So we, um, I don't know if you're all aware, but we are launching our post BSN DMP program in summer of 2024. And so that's a big deal at, at our school. So the following year, we're looking at um, a post doctoral specialization track. And we're starting to, to think about that. It is not formalized. We don't have a date yet. Um, what we're looking at either getting your DMP and then going into specialize or having a track during the DNP that would be longer than the seven quarters, obviously. Um, but that won't be built out until 2025 or 2026. Okay. It's not available now. Okay. But you would still have, with getting your DMP, you still have the option, whether it's with UCSF or a different school, to still specialize even after you've had your DMP? Yeah, that would be a postdoctoral specialization. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question, Yvonne. We have another question from Ayo. What is the cohort size? Also, any scholarships or funding available? Sure, the cohort size, um, we like to, to have around 25 in a cohort, 25 to 30. Um, if we have any more than that, we'll break out into different sections because in doctoral education, we really don't wanna go beyond around 24, 25 in a class. So we really um, um, try very hard to keep it at that number. Um, and the second part of the question was, uh, about scholarships and funding. Scholarships. Well, 
Um, we do have, I think, is Shondell on the line? I don't know if she is, but we do have a financial aid department that we can refer you to. And there's lots of um, options for loans and scholarships. Um, one that I can uh, address um, now is the uh, National Faculty Loan Forgiveness Program, which is 100% uh, funding minus the 15%. Actually, you get funded for the whole program except for 15% if you commit to teaching for three years after you graduate. And the teaching piece <clears throat> isn't necessarily at a university level. We're working with some of our colleagues um, that are nurse professional developers at Stanford that are qualifying for those, those funds because that's what they do every day is they teach in a hospital. They're not faculty. So there's lots of money out there from the government um, to keep people engaged as long as they teach. And we do have funding at UCSF for that, those, those, those dollars. The other thing that's worth exploring is through your own employer. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that more and more in um, several of the larger organizations um, in the Bay Area have begun to fund um, doctoral education a little bit more actively. So um, that's something that certainly is worth investigating, even if it's a partial um, offset of fees, because it benefits them in retaining you. Um, and helping you through the program, as well as benefiting you, obviously, with offsetting costs. Joe, is there anything else that you would add about that? Um, with regards to funding opportunities, like I mentioned, you could reach out to Shandell, or you could reach out to me, and I could put you in contact with Shandell. Uh, that's for internal funding. Um, the other thing that I would mention is, um, as you consider... Um, you know, this program, be aware that there is a myriad of support services and student success services that are offered uh, to all students in the program, right? So writing support, wellness, uh, disability services. So there's close to, I believe, like 17 different offices that provide supports to students. So it's not just the amazing academic support that you will get in your program from, you know, exceptionally qualified faculty and program administrators, but it's also the whole scaffold of support that students get um, along their pathway to completion. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Zavala. We have another question from Yvonne. Yvonne, go ahead. Hi again. Um, second question. I, um, I'm aware of like the changes that some nursing programs are going under due to accreditation. So I wanted to know um, if you guys have accreditation coming up for this program or? Sure, we're currently accredited uh, by CCNE and our re-accreditation is November of 2024. And we are extremely optimistic that we will be re-accredited. We don't have any outstanding issues. Thank you. I have to brag and say we made it out of the box the first first time with yeah. a ranking of 37 nationally out of 200 institutions in U.S. News and World Report. So we're pretty proud of that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Great job. But it set the bar high. Now we have to make sure that we have <laughs> no, no, no. We're we're very confident that we will do well next year with it. That's a great question, by the way. Yes. Oh, I like this. Congratulations. Thank you, Sumi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Carney. That was very good to, to share with, with us today. We have a question from Samuel. Uh, okay, I'm going to try and slow this down. Will UCSF have post FNP, DMP, EMP track? Samuel, you might need to come up and ask that question. Uh, Dr. Dr. Waxman, are you able to answer that? I'm, I'm curious, Samuel, what the EMP is Samuel okay we'll move on um Samuel if you would like to come off mic at some point just let us know we have an another question uh what does the DMP program cost roughly
Now, did you want to take take that one with the latest numbers? I can give a rough estimate, but do you have the latest? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about Emergency. that. Emergency. I still do that. You know, it's uh, after all I, these years. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the latest numbers. I will look for them right now to see if I do. Okay. But if you have an estimate, uh, Dr. Waxman, that would be great. Okay, great. While you're looking, we're just going to address the ENP as an emergency uh, nurse practitioner. So I don't know that there's an actual certification in that, um, but we don't have that at this time. An ENP, if that's the question, no. we do not have an ENP. That's correct. Hello, Dr. Lynch. Hello there. Sorry to be joining late. Got stuck in a commute home. That's fine. And dandy. <laughs> Jimmy, his hand is up. Jimmy? My hand. Hi. Uh, sorry, I don't have any um, way to put my picture up today, but uh, my question, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So my question is, I started the DMP program for Waldens and decided that that wasn't a good fit for me, completed the first course. But my ask is, is there a possibility to have that reviewed and considered for entering into the UCS program? So we currently take, um believe it's six units transfer in and our program is a cohort model and it's a flat rate tuition per quarter That's cool. um so we've had students that have just sort of come in and and taken the courses uh you know starting from the very beginning how many courses do you have under your belt jimmy Sorry, I'm trying to get to the speaker again. I think I'm on. It was just the it was the first course, completed that, and then um, stepped away to kind of rethink if that was the mm -hmm. right program for me. So it was just the first course, and I believe it was a a leadership course. I'll have to go back to my yeah um, yeah yeah. It would be best if you just start from scratch with us in a cohort model. Um, our curriculum is a little different than Walden, and mm -hmm. um, it, as I said, it's a flat rate per quarter. And you can only benefit from doing that with just that one course that wouldn't be really um, conducive to us trying to, you know, try to see if you can waive that because it's the same fee structure anyway, if that makes sense. It. it does. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Well, we're glad you haven't given up on the idea <laughs> of furthering your education. That's right. Having given up, just looking for the right fit. Yes. Good. Yeah, and our program, and I think we we spoke to this a little bit. It's a hybrid program. It's um pretty much online. We come into campus three times at the very beginning, in the middle, and at the end, and then we have synchronous Zoom meetings on about a weekly basis in the evenings. But everything else is online, so it's a different than the Walden model. Um, we really like seeing everyone up front for a couple of days to get oriented, to network. And we also have you meet some of the students from our current cohort. Um, and then we have you come back in the middle uh, to have some more leadership development and some boot camp, if you will. And then at the very end, you will be presenting your final project in a public forum. And then we have commencement. So it's a good balance. It's um, so you can do it online and then you get to see each other three times a year. Thank you, Dr. Waxman. We have another question. Um, could you give more information about the Postmasters DMP specialty tracks that will be available in the future? So as I said, we don't have those sorted out yet. We're talking about it. Um, and Dr. Lynch is here on the line, our Associate Dean. Um, and had mentioned that um, currently we're not doing the postdoctoral specialty, but we are talking about that and it wouldn't happen until 25 or 26. And the specialties that we have, we have about 10 specialties right now. So it would be based on the need. Um, clearly we're not going to offer a specialty with one student. So we'll most likely have FMP and psych mental health for sure. Those are, are, are very popular right, right now. But as we you know, get through the next year, we will be probably doing a needs assessment to see what the best uh, specialties are to do in a postdoctoral fashion. Dr. Lynch, did you wanna? No, I totally agree. Um, 
you know, actually starting uh, specialties with a DNP and a postmasters, it's considered a brand new program. Um, even though we've offered postma postmasters specialty at the master's level, and that probably doesn't make any sense. But the bottom line is, is that it's a new program, so it has to not only get review and endorsed in the School of Nursing, but also our campus, and then through um, the office of the president. So it's a process where we are required to do a, a cost and needs assessment before we would put it forward. So that's why um, we're talking about not offering that type of program um, because those are a lot of steps to go through. So not till fall of 2025 at the very earliest. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Uh, as of right now, Dr. Waxman and Dr. Carly, those are all the questions in the chat. So okay, great. So we'll um, open it up if anyone would like to just um, ask a question, raise their hand or. Dina, your hand is up, go ahead. Hello. Um, I have a question about the hours that uh, need to be like approved if you did a master's program. Mm -hmm. So I did my program at uh, Cal State Long Beach for pediatric nurse practitioner. And I was wondering if um, I need like proof of the hours I did, mm -hmm. like how, how would I get that? Because I did, I like did logs, but yeah, I didn't I'm gonna... get it like, yeah. Yeah, and your transcript will be reflective of those residencies and clinical experiences. And I'm going to, both Dr. Lynch and Dr. Curley are um, experts in pediatrics. I'm going to refer, refer to them. It's it's highly likely you had to do at least 500 or 540 hours um, to meet California's expectation if you yes. did it in here. Yeah. Um, so th that'll be evident on your transcript as either what's called residency or practicum courses. Um, oh, so it's really okay. easy for us to be able to see that. Sometimes we have to ask for syllabi to understand what the word at an individual place is. But for an APRN program like a PEDS, um, PNP, that's pretty easy to, to figure out. So oh, pretty okay. much you'd be guaranteed 500 incoming. Perfect. So I don't have to like go back and look for my logs. <laughs> no, no, no. I wouldn't have been able to find mine either. No, no, no. Do you have national certification as a PNP? Uh, Yes, I did it through the Pediatric National Certification Board. That's an, a piece of evidence that we can use to bypass looking for syllabi as well. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, good. Great. Oh, Sounds good. Like I'd love 500 to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And living in Long Beach, an online program, sounds like it would be a perfect fit for you. Yeah, we have quite a few students from the Southern California area. It's real easy to get up here those three times a year. And, um, you know, within our state, it's, you know, it's a big state, but um, easy, easy peasy to get up here. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? We've got a student funding link in the chat for those of you who want to go there. Um and there's uh, information regarding uh, tuition at that on that link as well in the chat. Yvonne. Hi again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I saw that the deadline is April 1st. Is that the deadline like every year? That's pretty that's much. The, okay. Whatever that Friday or Sunday, I think it's a Sunday that we... We close, it's around April 1st, 2nd, or 3rd every year. Okay. I was just asking because I, guess I would have to apply 2025 because my program finishes mm -hmm. in the summer. Okay. So be ready. So for you can make sure you get your statistics class done yeah. in the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Oh, sure. one more. Sorry. Um, since the program is online, I probably missed this for our practicum. Is that some, do we get to pick where that place is or is that? We, we try to have you do your practicum hours where you work. Oh, um, okay. 
So if you well, have, you know, a buy in from your site and agreement, but we also have other sites and suggestions for you to do your practicum hours. I mean, if you want to do something in health policy, you're not going to get that at your site. We're going to refer you to someone, you know, in Sacramento to work with. And if it's in simulation, we'll refer you to someone else. But you can also get log in lots of your practicum hours where you work. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Who's next? Ayo? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, I, I just have a question just to follow up on Yvonne. Then cross my mind. Uh, the application deadline is April next year. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do, do applicants get the determination of admission uh, after April? You know, would you be looking forward to around May? Or would prospective applicants, you know, that you're really considering be notified before then, almost like if, as a come basis? Just... Just a idea. Now, that's a really good question. Typically in this program, we um, wait until the deadline has passed. And then we, as a committee, as a faculty, get together and review everything. And you'll, you're will you notified um, no later than mid-June, I think, uh, Dr. Carly, is that right? Mm -hmm. No later than mid-June. So it isn't considered a rolling admission where you'd be notified um, right after you apply. We wait until the deadline uh, passes. Thank you. Sure. And is it IO or AO? It's IO. IO. I okay. get asked a lot. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, Dina, your hand is up. Yeah, I have a question about the statistics course. Um, since it's been more than three years that I've taken one, it, during the application process, I don't think I'll be done with it. Is there a way I can put like it pending? Like I'll like because I'm going to sign up for one. But I yes. Was just the requirement is for it to be completed with evidence of completion um, by the time the program starts. But oh, okay. to finish your application, we need to, you to show a commitment that you're in a course. So we oh. ask for a receipt or some evidence that you're enrolled in a okay. course that will be done at the time of when the program actually starts, because okay. that buys you summertime to work on it. Okay, thank yeah. you. And we can give you ideas for a lot of online ways, as well as community colleges near you. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking of, community college near mm -hmm. me. Um, just do like the online course. That's a good choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Start. I don't know if I could chime in. I just thought maybe it might be a useful information. Uh, Dina, there was a list that was sent for prospective places you could take your statistics because mine is over eight years as well. And there was this website called Outlier dot oh, okay. org where you could do online courses so i had sign up there and actually they have a 30 percent discount going on right now so you might be you know if you like coupons that was a good deal so <laughs> okay thank you it's better than know. the community college offer yeah, yeah, yeah and it looks like a very solid program oh, okay. thank know. you that's great yeah. happy holidays <laughs> <laughs> thank you all right we have some really um great links in the chat for information regarding financial aid, tuition. Um, I think the statistics, the list of statistics courses that we recommend is also on the website. So um, any more questions? You know, before we're finished, I just want to say that um, I'm excited to see this many individuals um, at this point of the year um, wanting more information about the post master's DNP. Um, of course, I am biased to the program, but it is an excellent program. It's a program that works well for individuals that are working, whether that's part time or full time. So, this is really an executive level um, efficient course that really gives you an amazing educational foundation. So your your completion of this commitment um, over the seven quarters will really fly by fast 
and there is a good bit of work, but um, it's really an excellent program. And I, I hope that we see your applications in the future. Thank you, Dr. Lynch. Thank you for being with us tonight as well. Looks like you got so, another question. Felicia? Um, thank you. So I actually heard about the program through my employer. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know if this is just the same program with Kaiser. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I, um, so I sent some, inf I sent a question for some information um, previously. So I'm, yeah, that's my question. <laughs> so Felicia, we have um, relationships with several of the health systems in the Bay Area. Kaiser is one of them. And um, they, we have Kaiser students that are just staff in Kaiser. Um, and we also have nurse scholars, the Kaiser Scholars Program, whereby you apply to be in this program and then you are the funded if you get accepted. So um, we, we accept students all throughout Kaiser, whether they're scholars or not. So that's something that you would follow up with Janet Sohall on? Yes, I've already sent, I've been in contact okay. with her. Okay, perfect. I actually went through the, um, I just finished the, the master's program at USF. Oh, good. good perfect. And I did the BSN at Samuel Merritt. Okay, Excellent. so you're a, a product of of Kaiser Scholars Program. That's great. Yeah, because I, I was I was trying to remember if I did statistics. I know in the Samuel in my bachelor's program we had to do statistics every single term. Oh, but I don't oh, think I nice. did it in my. I don't think I <laughs> right. I don't think I did it in my um in the master's program though. So I think I I think I probably haven't had it since 2020. Well. It's close. But we had to do it definitely, definitely every single term. There was statistics. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Can I take a moment to share something on the website um, just to make sure that your eyes go to this as a source for information? That would be great. Are you able to see my, my slide? Not yet. Probably not. Okay, hang on a second. Share. While you're pulling it up, KT, do you want to address the question about how many hours per week it's oh, here we go. Um, yeah, I mean, it varies from quarter to quarter and class to class, but I would say anywhere between eight and 20 hours a week, depending on, on the load of, of that particular quarter. So a lot of our students actually um, have been known to take a day off. Uh, PTO to do their studies, um, weekend days, evenings. Uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is designed for the working professional. So it's it's a you're able to balance your work with your studies and your there's a lot of reading in this um, program to prepare you for the assignments and that can be done anywhere, anytime, um, you know, along the week whenever you have free time. So you definitely need to. Uh, be the master of time management. All right. Did that work? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to bring your attention. So this is our website for the program. These happen to be some of our active students, but there's two things to show you along this task bar here. One of which is the DMP projects that we had mentioned before, where we have a listing by cohort of actual projects that they've done. Um, this top one, it scrolls backwards. So this group was the most recent graduates that we had from last spring. And at the very bottom, it has a list of abstracts for them. But for each of the cohorts, it has the titles for them. So you can get a sense of the level of work that people put into um, their projects. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is this image of the curriculum, just a curriculum at, the, at a glance. It's a highly online program, as Dr. Waxman mentioned, um, seven quarters in duration, um, and it averages somewhere between seven and 11 units per quarter, inclusive of courses as well as the practicum, depending on how many hours you need to complete. Um, but there's typically three courses on any given quarter, and it follows a cohort model. So everyone uh, regardless of which pathway they came in, follows the same curriculum plan, which has been really beneficial in our experience um, with students really getting to know one another really well, forming really tight ties with their cohort 
and really living it together. Um, but it is a way that we could shape a curriculum that really builds sequentially to prepare you best for its second half where you work intensively on your project. So definitely go to this nursing.ucsf.edu. Um, you could just even Google UCSF DNP and the postmasters will come up as one of your choices and it will give you the faculty outcomes, the requirements again for the two pathways and the projects I think is an important thing for you to look at. Thanks, Dr. Carolla, for sharing yeah. that. It's awesome. It looks like we have about a minute left. Is any does it, are there any other questions for us? Any of us? Mimi, I'll turn it back over to you for wrap up. Uh, Dr. Waxman, we have one question. Uh, okay. Someone's asking: Papers due every week. <laughs> <laughs> what's we, your definition of a paper? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah. There's a not, variety not of a types of assignments. Not a discussion. I'm saying like, yeah. like um, with, I don't even know how my brain just wiped out. Um, I can't even remember. That's a shame. There are a lot of assignments oh. and the assignments aren't always papers. How's that? Right. There could be discussion forums. Um, videos, or other things. short videos. videos. Presentations, slides. It doesn't. Um, always have to be a paper, but there are um, APA assignments. format. That's what I was thinking. A lot of APA. papers every week with APA <laughs> format. APA is is our writing style at UCSF. Yes. Okay. So my brain turned off. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's late in the day. You're not alone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Waxman. I want to say a big thank you to everyone for joining us today. Again, if you have any other questions, please be sure to reach out. A big thank you to Dr. Waxman, Dr. Carly, Dr. Savala, and Dr. Lynch for attending. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Bye now.